Workshops. Um, one that starts at 10 and then another that's at 1.30, um, or 11, 12.30, sorry. Um, and this will be from basically 10 to 2 in the Hub Flex Theater on this Saturday. After that, at 2 p.m. in the same space, there will be the inaugural meeting of the Penn State Committee for Democracy in Brazil. So hopefully some of you will be able to make those events. Um, and there will also be really important next Monday at 4 p.m a screening of a documentary by Maria, Ma, Maria Franco called I, a Black Woman, Resist. And Maria is really part of this week is to honor her life and legacy. Um, she was assassinated a year ago on March 14th. Um, and so just to really have a sort of coming together to think about what's happening in Brazil and to remember her really important legacy. Um, that will be as con um, paired with a panel discussion that will feature uh, Zach Morgan from History, Rafael Pagilia, who was part of the Pesol Committee, and also um, Cynthia Young, as well as the director. So bringing in sort of both African American studies, history, Brazilian studies, and hopefully having a really interesting, provocative, and thoughtful collection on her life. In addition to these events about Brazil, there's also a talk tomorrow that um, our colleague Trizia Rivera is organized uh, as part of the Latino Latino Studies Speaker Series. And it will be a talk by Stephanie Rivera Perutz at 5 p.m. Um, and it's called Assembly of Belonging, Thinking Sovereignty from the Periphery with Luisa Capetillo and Ophelia Rodriguez Acosta. And that is in Foster Arbitrary. So hopefully some of you can attend that as well. Okay. So Maria Lidvangi is currently a visiting assistant professor of Muslim Brazilian Literatures and Cultures at Princeton University. Before that, she taught at the Universidade Estadual do Sudoeste da Bahia before moving to Stanford University, where she taught for the past decade. Her research focuses on the study of novel and modern poetry, indigenous thought, and literary theory. These topics intersect with the idea of listening in writing, a concept that goes beyond the orality writing divide especially given its strong resonances with Amerindian thought and marginalized communities in Latin America, the Caribbean, and in and Africa. In 2009, she published her first book, a collection of essays, Marinho Manhattan, in Science of Luther Foro Brasileira, in such a bad sense. Her second book, Writings by Ear, Clarice Pistactor and Oral Novel, which is not exciting, this is the copy from the library, so, um, was published by the University of Toronto Press in 2018. <laughs> that, that, that looks pretty. The library makes it very much. Um, it develops the concepts of writing idea, the oral novel, and echo-poetics. She'll be sharing more about this project with us today. She's currently at work on her next book project, which proposes a listening vocabulary through a study of the fictional process of Juan Pimentes Paz. She's co-edited trans poetic exchange, Arology Campos, Book Battle Battle, and other multiversal dialogues, which is forthcoming with Buckingham University Press, and the dossier Theories of the Contemporary in South America, which was published in the Visa de Estudios Hispanicos, and she co-edited that with Hector Royos, who joined us last year for one of these conflict luncheons. So just to get brought a sense of her work as the sense of how she's still very invested in luso afro brazilian studies, but also making dialogues with comparative literature, literary theory, indigenous thought, and sort of other disciplines, and really thinking beyond Brazil as an exceptional case. I think it's very important. What also excites me about her work is that she proposes theoretical interventions that are relevant to other literary traditions and disciplines through attentive readings of canonical works of Brazilian literature really bringing Brazil into these other discussions. In addition, in addition to her extensive scholarship, Manilia has made invaluable contributions to the field of Luso-Afro-Brazilian studies through her service and teaching. 
She has co-organized a range of events, including the 2016 Conference of the American Portuguese Studies Association and Black Feminisms Across the Americas, which is in honor of Mandy and Franco, and is happening this Thursday and Friday at um, Princeton, and is featuring Angela Davis, so it should be a really wonderful event. If anyone can join to Princeton, please try to do so. She is also one of the following founding editors of the literary journal Madeline Floema. She was the book review editor of Ellipsis and then later the co-executive editor of Journal of Municipal Studies, which are two the same journal but just different names and iterations of them. She has taught innovative courses including Black Brazil and Afro Brazil, oral culture, literature, and digital media. She is currently the co-director of the Sense and Sound.org digital project and the research group is to by Sulta Listening Studies in Brazil and affiliated faculty of the Versitas. She's the nucleus for the studies of diversity, of tolerance, and conflict at the University of Sao Paulo. So with that, I'd like to welcome Maria and pass the one to her. Perfect. So thank you very, very much for this beautiful audience. Uh, thank you very much for being here with me. And thank you, Krista. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, the luncheon series, for this invitation. It's my honor and my pleasure to be sharing with you my research, mainly focused in this book, Writing by Year, by the City Spector, and the Aural Novel. So I will speak about 30 minutes, 35 maximum, and, uh, and then we'll open to discussion. So, And uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I have selected passages of the book. So it's not a kind of linear presentation. I'm kind of trying to present as much as I can of this suggestion about listening in writing. So let, let me go here. So in this uh, book, I examine the broader significance of the articulation of the notion of writing by ear found in the work of uh, uh, Brazilian novelist Clarice Lispector. What it implies is a mode of writing that has as its foundational image an ear listening large pink and dead that appears in the first paragraph of Lispector's first novel, Near to the Wild Heart, published in 1943. So the first paragraph of her first novel, um, there is a child listening to uh, her father typing to the uh, machine. Uh, and, uh, and then there is this kind of surrealistic image of this ear listening large, pink, pink and dead. Um, that appears in this first paragraph. This image would return in the final novel she published in her lifetime, The Hour of the Star, published in 1977, in the guise of a male narrator who claims, I write by ear. So my study follows this trajectory of images about this dead, pink, large ear through this notion of what, what does it mean to write by ear. So first, this idea suggests um, a reframing of authorship as a form of active and fertile aural reception. So it also requests the written text as a mute sign that nonetheless resonates and echoes within the mind and body of the reader. So I read the specter's ultra-sensitive ear as a figurative and eminently modern theory of writing. So I consider this fact of fiction as a case study, but as well as a source for theory, to rethink the novel as the aural novel, which means the novel as an aural space and authorship as a locus of reception more than production. So despite the differences between speech and writing, both are manifestations of language. But what does it mean to think about the relationship between the ear and the process of writing? The ear does not produce language. The ear is mute. It does not speak and it has no voice. 
Although it occupies a fundamental position in the cycle of spoken language, the ear is basically a receptive organ, the channel and the labyrinth through which the sounds of the outside world and the inside world enter and communicate within our body. So unlike voice and writing, which produce speech and text, listening is silent and receptive. So this was kind of what I learned by following the images of Lispector uh, relating listening and silence in her texts. And this idea of receptivity and muteness, uh, the following questions arise. What is the specific aesthetic for which listening in writing calls? What is the relation that listening in writing establishes with silence, echo, and the sounds of the world? How are we to understand authorship <coughs> when writers present themselves as objects of reception rather than subjects of production. So this is, this is something that we reappear in other uh, authors in Brazilian uh, history, but also in Amerindian um, thoughts and, and texts, is the idea that the author is not the owner of the text, but it's more kind of uh, a receptive body that uh, embodies the sounds of the streets, the sounds of the community, and uh, it speaks more through an unconscious and, uh, and, uh, and um, non-controlled activity as an authorship, and more as a receptive body that transmits this kind of collective voice and sounds. Um, so what is the relationship between the book as a mute text and the verbal uh, practice that surrounds it? What is the relationship between reading literature in Brazil and the significant percentage of Brazil's population that does not possess alphabetic literacy? In which ways does the robust oral and aural culture of Brazil shape literary genres and forms with um, um, European roots? So basically, what I tried to bring to the discussions within the Brazilianist field was besides the relationship between writing and orality, what happens when we think about listening? Trying to think listening as a third space between writing and orality. So on one hand, I'm concerned with shedding light on the narrative representation of listening, and try to rethink fiction through listening or novel through listening considering precisely an auditory practice that transcends, let's say, the dichotomy of speech and writing. So the main point is that listening as a third term takes part in both poles. Listening is part of the oral dimension of speech, and it's likewise part of the silent dimension of written words. So it's not an opposition between written silence and orality, or between text and speech, or between silence and sound, but it's more the conjugation of these two moments, they are friction. It's a writing by ear, that is a text, that is the result of the hearing of sounds that remain in writing as silence, right? And writing by ear and the novel as this aural space and authorship as a locus of reception more than production. So basically, I developed this notion of writing by ear following the spectrum's images, and conceptions, and then I suggested the notion of the oral novel to think other novels in the Brazilian uh, tradition, and then I suggest a term that is echo poetics, the poetics of echo, uh, to by reading one one of her novels and thinking precisely this expanded sense um, sense of listening to reverberations and uh, non sonorous sounds, let's say. Uh, vibration and etc. So one of the um, uh, the suggestions was to precisely think what is the oral novel. I try to read a little bit about that for you. And basically, it's to rethink the notion or to kind of enter into the discussions of the novel as a space of polyphony, as um, conceptualized by Mikhail Bakhtin, right? So. It, can be, the idea of writing by ear, can be a contribution to this 
um, uh, theory of the novel in the direction of echoes, reverberations, and resonances. So if multiple contradictory discourses are put into dialogue in the fabric of the novel as a democratic space of voices, and this is back the idea of polyphony, right? In the case of writing by ear, we have novels created as a space of listening. So this space of listening is what I'm uh, suggesting is called the hour of novel. And then in this um, uh, chapter, I started by quoting um, uh, two fictions that help advance this definition of the hour of novel. Uh, Mia Couto from Mozambique and Toni Morrison. So in an interview um, titled, not incidentally, Mia Couto's Listening, uh, we learn about the auditory origins of his fictional project. Essentially, he says, as a very quiet, quiet child, um, he reminds how the art of listening was important for him, closely related to the oral universe of African cultures, as well as the inclusion of music and the spoken prosody in his writings. But the question of listening in writing also for him involves more than just the oral transmission of storytelling, but it also entails a conscious listening to silence. So he says, there is a learning process that more rural societies confer upon us. Because in the city, we get tripped up when there's silence and it becomes necessary to resolve it. This sense of discomfort in contrast is not experienced in rural Africa. People have in silence not some kind of absence, but rather a presence. Something is being said in these moments. It has to do with the strong belief in the invisible world and in the spirituality that revolves around the living. This art of listening in writing finds itself mixed with Koto's training as a biologist as he defines biology as a language and a manner of listening. He says, biology prolonged my appetite for listening to the world and to understand that there are voices that have been excluded due to a certain anthropocentric <coughs> vision according to which we are the only ones with something to say. My manner of embracing biology has been from an attempt to understand languages and learn codes. Today, and not in a metaphorical way, I listen to trees, plants, and insects, because all of these beings wish to say something, right? It's for this reason that they take on colors and smells and difference of form that please me so much to listen to, right? So to listen to trees, plants, and insects, um, giving this idea of listening to the world through prose fiction, right? and uh, going beyond the articulated anthropocentric language. And this is very important in Lispector's um, uh, texts also, this broad sense of listening to trees and also listening as animals. And um, I follow the motif of the horse, for example, in, the, in many of her texts. And um, in special, the Passion According to GH, which was published in 1964, where there is this narrator woman uh, who enters into um, the, the space of um, her former maid. And um, there's a lot in this book. It's, it's, it's um, one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. And, um, and there's this encounter with the cockroach and uh, how the main character kind of became an insect. And this whole uh, um, chamber, this whole bedroom, becomes a kind of echoing chamber. And so the, the whole story was how I experienced it, something that I, I lost my human setup during this kind of experience that she, she took in this space. How can I narrate this experience now with words? And there's a lot of discussions about precisely how with words can I reproduce the muteness of sounds, reverberations, etc. So, in the case of the aural in the loft, 
um, asked by Christina Davis about her written voice in an interview in 1986, Toni Morrison answers, that might mean that my efforts to make oral literature, and she stresses A-U-R-A-L, work because I do hear it. It has to read in silence and that's just one phase of the work, but it also has to sound and, and if it doesn't sound right, even though I don't speak it when I'm writing it, I have this interior piece in my head that reads so that the way I hear it is the way I write it. And I guess that's the way I would read it aloud, right? So I think this, this precise, the idea of the way I speak or write is the way I, the way I speak it, the, sorry, the way I hear is the way I write it. It's not the same as saying the way I speak, it's the way I write it, right? So it's not only this idea of transmitting the oral through writing. It's, it's a different set. So it implies that listening is implies listening to the rhythms, the flow of speech and sounds, accents and prosody, and not only to the reproduction of oral language in written text. Another important aspect of the oral is the active participation of readers as listeners. The oral, says Morrison, has to do with the participation of the other, that is the audience, the reader. This participatory aspect corresponds uh, in her text to the similes of holding one hand, which is interesting because Lispector used the same simile like uh, calling the reader to, to hold her hand while reading. And then, of course, the whole relation with the structure of call and response, improvisation, jazz, spiritual, blues songs. And, um, um, and then there is also uh, the aspect of, of course, speaking about uh, millions of voices that were silenced in, and, uh, in, the, in the history, and also a kind of ethics of listening. She says, an artist for me, a black artist for me, is not a solitary person who has no responsibility to the community. It's a totally communal experience. And, um, and this communal experience is what I found interesting to think also, listening not only as a personal individual practice. How can I, we think about listening as a collective practice? This is one question that I don't address here, but it's something I keep, keep, keep thinking about. And also this authorial aspect of listening is also part of this getting out of myself, right, and open to this collective uh, sounds and voice. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, presenting now some of the features of the oral novel in the Brazilian context. And basically it has three main features that repeats itself in different authors. The first one is the duplication of authorship through the creation of characters who are themselves writers and presented as apprentices of a form they don't master and that for the same reason they feel free to experiment with. So there is a kind of component of metafictional <coughs> discussions that comes from Fernando Machado de Assis in late 19th century, where so we have a book that is being written while we are reading the book. And it's being written by a character who does not possess the knowledge to write a book completely. It's more improvisational. So by creating the secondary writers, for the supposed authors, the real authors freed themselves through the structure of I need to write only if I know what I'm doing, because it's not me that is the author of this text, it's this character, right? So the, the, the authorial uh, dominion is not, cannot be accused, you don't know how to write a good novel in the kind of, for example, <coughs> European framework, and you, I can deal with this form. Uh, the second aspect is a conversational pattern establishing a direct dialogue with their readers as if the book could change according to the reader's answers and expectations. So this conversational uh, pattern is, is very uh, present. 
and third, the exposure of their book as a work in progress, an improvised draft, being written as if at the same time that is being read. So listening is involved in all these procedures, right? So as they delegate authorship, the actual authors assume a receptive standing point. The conversation aspect uh, brings this interaction with a supposed audience. And if these uh, techniques can be part of the genre of the novel in general, the fact that it's repeated in many authors uh, in prose fiction in Brazil needs some attention why this happens. And the idea basically is that uh, um, precisely they are kind of peripheral positions on one hand, in relation to the European tradition, allows, in this form, allows them to play with this tradition, and at the same time, trying to get the attention of uh, a culture that is totally or dominantly oral and oral oriented, much more than a literate society, right? In comparison with it to Spanish America, Brazil, um, the, the literate aspect, the educational aspect of Brazil is much delayed in comparison to Hispanic America. And at the same time, the oral, oral, strongly presence of Afro-Brazilian cultures and uh, Merindian uh, cultures, it's spread around, around, uh, around Brazil. Nonetheless, our tradition about Brazilian national literature Right? Um, consider Brazil as monolingual, Portuguese, right? But we have at least 180 um, native languages. We have uh, this whole uh, sonorities of uh, black, uh, black Brazil. So all this kind of thing about Brazil as, uh, as an ear, and uh, a lot of resonances and, and rhythms, and these authors, they are compelled to incorporate that, how they do, how they negotiate all these aspects. So this is, is part of the, the discussion that we can discuss later. Um, so basically, I took this, um, uh, this conceptualization and um, uh, to think about Brazil but in connection to also the cosmopolitanism of Brazilian literature, incorporating other languages, incorporating, changing the Portuguese language, and at the same time, this popular culture present. So I think I will, I will end um, only quoting parts of the, kind of the structure of the book, the chapters, and then we can discuss. So the first uh, chapter situated listening in writing in the broader context of Brazilian literature, and the other uh, cha four chapters focus solely on a reading of Respector's novel. So for example, the chapter Writing by Ear precisely starts with a comparison between Respector's Writing by Ear and Augusto de Campos' concrete poet um, um, and his notion of pulsation in order to highlight the aural aspect of poetry and prose. The main goal is to present or to suggest a listening history of Brazilian literature. Um, and it's also important to, uh, in this uh, chapter, to, to underscore this uh, relevance for literatures, this listening aspect and its relevance for literatures that tends to maintain an ethical, poetic, and political connection with communities deeply shaped by forms of verbal communication that do not rely on the mediation of writing. Right? So um, is this, uh, this broader aspect that I was trying to connect to Afro-Brazilian uh, cultures and indigenous cultures, although I do not address this in this book, focus only on respect, but it's kind of suggestion, right? How this resonates with these other aspects. Um, then, um, in the aural novel, basically, I, I present what I was um, talking to you just now about this notion of the aural novel, and I read it, how it works in Aura da Estrela, the hour of the star by Inspector, and then I kind of 
remind the other works by Machado de Assis, by Oswaldo Andrade, how they contribute to form this out of novel. And I suggest the possibility of thinking this in other authors such as Mario de Andrade, Graciliano Ramos, contemporary authors, Paulo Leminski, and many others that can be read through this writing by here. Uh, idea, right? Then there is a chapter uh, here in the Wild Heart where I offer uh, offers a close analysis of the inspector's first novel and the <coughs> image of the dead ear. <coughs> and then I suggest a connection with Vincent van Gogh's act of cutting his ear, itself a gesture that marks modern art. So this unusual comparison has requested the development of a sinus argumentation that follow the flow of unconscious connections. So the dead ears offer a Lispector's image an occasion to understand a series of Lispector's motifs that will reappear in her novel Agua Viva, narrated by a character who is also a painter. So, um, and, and I read the motif of the sacrifice of the ear, in the case of Lispector, corresponding to the sacrifice of the voice in silent writing. So it's again when you use the idea that the voice when we read uh, fiction and literature, right? What is this voice? It's a, it's a metaphor because when we read the text is mute, there is no voice. But there is a voice that resonates in our mind. But so more shifting from voice to silence and considering silence as part of this listening process. When you read in silent, the text resonates in our body, even if it's silent, right? So it's basically going to the sacrifice of the voice and the motif of uh, um, flowers, dead flowers, and other motifs that appear in the spectrum and can be connected to the paintings of Van Gogh. Um, this idea of the figure of amputation, right? Following that. Then in chapter Loud Object, I turn my attention to Agua Viva, which uh, has the working title of Loud Object. And then I trace the image of this loud object as being the union of the ear and the typewriter. And then I follow the discussions of Friedrich Kittler's discussion on Nietzsche and the typewriter as an occasion to relate Lispector's work to that mode of modernity according to which the sacrifice of the voice gives rise to an, an attentive and anatorial listening. So this work of Kittler was a discovery for me in the media studies discussing um, how women come to write, become authors, or can be um, authorized as authors after uh, the invention of the typewriter, or the phonograph, and how the phonograph affected the literary field, etc. Well, chapter um, six, Ecopoetics, I focus on the passion according to GH and this whole discussions about listening through echoes and listening as an insect and, um, and then the need of echo in contrast as found in Ovid, in contrast to the myth of Narcissus, right? We have the eye and, and, the, and listening connected through this myth and, um, and so this notion of echo poetics. Finally, the concluding chapter, Hearing Horses. I follow these images of horses and listening that appears in different texts of uh, the spectrum and the kind of her bestiary. And, um, and then um, um, a kind of thing about the spectrum as a fictionist philosopher or as a writer centaurus, which is an image that uh, makes a hybrid text, a text that is fiction, but it can also be read as an essay, but also as a kind of uh, theory, theory of fiction itself. Um, so basically, this is this is the suggestion, and uh, and I hope that we can we can talk more. I can answer your comments and questions in relation to this project or other projects um, and uh, and of course also what's happening in Brazil now. <coughs> Thank you very much.
minutes or so for questions. So questions, comments. Victoria and the Hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very interesting and um, you know, very informative for uh, my own work in, in general. But I wanted to ask you about the pedagogical aspect of uh, listening um, that comes out of, of your book and your own projects and the way we can translate that into you know the day by day teaching. Oh, or just kind of good. the pedagogical aspect when talking to audiences that come from other fields. Or, you know, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Very, very good question. Yes, I am, um, for example, in a course that I offer about uh, Jean Guimarães Rosa, uh, whose work is really related to oral, oral communities and oral um, in writing, I experienced it I, with students um, first reading, read aloud, and um, and uh, what it happens, what kind of uh, uh, interpret, how, how your interpretation changes when you leave your silent reading bubble, and it's it's asked to perform the text aloud. And I think the discussions that come out with this were very interesting, even more when we are working with different languages, right? Students. American English students reading Portuguese, Brazilian literature, or other languages, literatures. How how does it read? Helps allowed um, um, uh, helps to think better translational process. And but together with a, a colleague from the University of São Paulo, who wrote a book um, years ago called Sonic Textures, we experienced that in class, which means that. Students, this was an undergrad uh, class, they um, were asked to select passages of, we're reading, for example, we're reading this novel by uh, Guimarães Rosa, a short novel, which ends in an Afro-Brazilian party called the Congada party. And, uh, and in rural communities in Minas Gerais. So students were reading the text and kind of going back to the oral sources that inspired the writer, and listening and seeing videos and music from these oral communities. So the idea is that the final product is that you need to produce um, a sonic text, which means that you select passages of uh, Guimarães Rosa's fiction, and then you, using audacity and other um, tools in the, in the computer, you produce it an, an edition of texts and sounds. So you can you, you read aloud or you ask someone to read aloud. You can include, you can read in Portuguese, in English, or in Spanish, and then you can include, based on your selections, um, sounds from these oral communities that were based for the creation. And um, it has been a very, very interesting uh, kind of bringing to kind of the final paper uh, model, a more performative. And this, not only to, not only to be an artistic uh, thing, but how this changes the approach and the, the, the interpretation of the text. And that the results have been, has been very, very interesting, also with respect to those texts. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about some of the political conditions <coughs> under which um, Luz Becker was writing. Um, you know, you started off with the question of how do we understand authorship when authors position themselves as recipients rather than producers of text. And I can think of any number of, of political situations in which authors have been told precisely to do that. Um, as someone who works on East Asia, the, the, the one that comes to mind most readily is, is um, Mao's talks at, at Yenin, where he's like, all right, <laughs> you bourgeois authors, right, you're going to go down to the countryside, you're going to listen, right. and to really kind of funnel that into um, popular culture. Um, that doesn't sound like what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in understanding what's at stake or kind of what's motivating this, this turn to listen. Right. Okay. In, in the case of Inspector, um, I, I related this listening presence in her texts through her Jewish origins and, uh, and the history of uh, the persecution of her family arriving in the northeast of Brazil in the 
She was born in the 1920s. She arrived in Brazil, she was one year old. And her family was um, fleeing the pogroms in uh, Ukraine, right? And, uh, and um, so first she had that experience of her first childhood um, with Yiddish sounds in her house, living in poor communities, her family was, was poor, but in the northeast of Brazil. And how, for example, these sonorities will be part of her late, last novel, The Hour of the Star, um, where she mixes, the, the, the main character names is Maccabea, which is related to the Maccabees, and the Jewish Maccabees um, rebels, and and the sounds of the hepenchi, that form of popular uh, song and poetry found in the Northeast. And also the character is a typist, but she's kind of semi-literate. She's a poor woman migrated, migrating from Northeast to Rio de Janeiro. So all this kind of sound experience in her life came in this late uh, novel. And then she lived um, outside Brazil for if I'm not wrong, 16 years when she was married to a diplomat. And then English and French were part of her um, kind of listening uh, experience with uh, um, multilingualism. So in her case, it's not a history of someone going um, to community or communities and bringing that, as in Guimarães Rosa or Mario de Andrade, for example, but it's more kind of, um, she was a kind of esponja. She was absorbing these sonorities that surround her infancy, her childhood in Northeast, but also the sonorities in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, in the, in the Afro-Brazilian kind of black religion is part of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of her universe. And it's quoted in, for example, even in the Passion According to G.H., it was a black maid who left the house, and, and it's the room of the black maid that she enters. And then she uses images as coming from uh, Candomblé, which is the, the saints go, they occupy our bodies, right? And as a horse, and horse is also a term that is used, the spirits come, and, uh, and we get possessive of them, and we speak to them. So something of this Jewish, Brazilian Afro was part of her universe, and um, I, I think that in her case was mostly in that direction. Um, Amalia, Tag. <laughs> I was interested in uh, the two moments of uh, metafictionality that you were talking about, specifically the second one where you talk about uh, the conversational dialogue with the reader that goes on. Uh, in my experience, uh, the metafictional gesture towards the uh, reader in some sort of dialogue ends up being a silencing gesture. That is to say, there's often this anticipation of what the reader is thinking uh, and speaking to that and the reader, at least this reader, is never thinking what the author is telling me that I'm thinking in that moment. Um, and so it feels like I'm being controlled, it feels manipulative, it feels sort of the opposite of uh, me being put into this listening mode, which I was maybe already in, but something else is going on there. So I'm curious if you could give some of the examples uh, so that I can kind of understand where you're so these features that I'm describing here, I first found together in the work of Machado de Assis, um, the posthumous memoirs of Gascubas and then Don Casmo. His latest novels repeat the same framework of this supposed author writing a book and and um, not being someone who masters writing process, and then because the character doesn't master writing, calls the readers um, uh, as if the book was being written now. 
So if, like I said, no, look, I'm, I'm putting this chapter here, but it should be at the end. So forget me for that. Or please, you reader, you want a linear story, and I'm reading more like a drunk word. And my text has no sequence. So kind of, um, uh, in this sense, the reader is represented as someone who could answer back and kind of help in the structure of the book as if the book was a draft. And of course, it, it, it cannot answer, or he or she cannot answer back. But it is as if the reader has kind of agency, a possibility of agency, right? <clears throat> and also, of course, this kind of uh, conversational pattern kind of to disguise the, the, the literate aspect of the text itself. And but does that work for you? For me, it's just the opposite. For me, it's in those moments where I feel like I have zero agency. Uh -huh. Because because it's I'm um, being erased, and that, you know what I mean. It's it's by making the gesture, it's sort of highlighting the fact that I don't have control. Okay. But for you, it feel it feels like oh, he's making this gesture. That yeah, it's it, what I think is that in this case, because it seems like a convert, it's, he's talking to me. It's it as I am not writing a book. It's like a, it's like conversational. Mm -hmm. So it kind of in this sense that kind of takes out the weight of reading a very long novel and in, in, a, in a culture where reading is problematic. And not by chance in his case and the others, also, books are short. Also, La Hora da Estrela, etc. So have a kind of, this kind of, a, a gesture of uh, trying to bring to the, to bringing these readers to the book kind of disguising the book as a book. But this is one aspect. The other aspect, and, the, and, the, and then I think it goes in, in your uh, sense, is, for example, in Guimarães Rosa, this is really, really very interesting. Because there, what we have, we have an oral book, um, the Grand Septon Veredas, huge novel, 500 pages. It opens with the sign of someone who starts speaking. And the one who speaks is Rio Baldo, is a character, a semi-literate character from the Sertão, the, the, the backlands of Brazil. And uh, he's, 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 not a, he's not a literate doctor, but he's talking to a listener who is mute, who is silenced, the whole book. So we as our readers are, are put in the position of the listener, and he says, well, oh, you doctor, so you, you know how to think, you know how to write, you have the answers, answer me. And you never can answer him because the questions that he asks us are impossible to answer because they are totally paradoxical. And he's kind of a big mouth, anthropophagic big mouth, incorporating philosophy from Eastern, Western origins, other texts, creating a language like a James Joycean uh, experiment. And, um, and it's interesting because it's, it's easy as if the illiterate or semi-literate poor character who never speaks is the only one who, who speaks during these 500 pages. And we, the literate, knowledgeable uh, scholars, are mute, right? So, and this is a political stance, very strong in this, in this case. Thank you for a really evocative and thought-provoking talk. Um, my my commentish, questionish uh, speech that I'll be about to make, I, I think builds a bit on what Victoria was asking regarding pedagogy. And what John, you were talking about in regards to metafictional sort of manipulation in some ways of the reader, and and I'm really thinking about um, your question of how we build a kind of collective ethics of audience listening and. I'm thinking about how the history of the novel itself is involved in a kind of regulation of, of readership, of regulation of writing and reading. And so when you talked about um, this example, Michel de Assis, and how he's sort of developing a practice of writing that subverts this kind of regulation of writing itself by it subverts the an expectation of illustrating a, ma a pedagogical mastery in some ways of knowledge yeah. and of skill of that. And the, the flip side of that is how then the novel or, or you know, an oral 
oral novel, oral literature can also partic either participate in or break down the regulation of reading. Mm -hmm. And I think about this particularly with, um, with the question of literacy, certainly in Brazil, certainly in, um, within indigenous cultures and practices of, of those, that circulation. And so, question mark? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> this is a big question mark. I mean, I think that all these authors uh, thought about that and need to deal with that. And this is the huge delay. How, for example, even Guimarães was with this huge project where the ones who spoke who speaks are the ones who are not considered to be the writers of a book, right? It's this oral community speaking, right? And, uh, and um, he was told, no, no one will read your text. Your text is too erudite. It's erudite, it's like it enjoys. So you are, you are speaking, you are using them as characters of your novels, but they cannot read your text. But on the other hand, his work is being brought to the world, to Minas Gerais rural communities where he, he is from, he was from, and is being performatized, it's being theatralized by students from high schools or, or um, and so his work is when it's read aloud, read aloud in classrooms, for example, it uh, it, uh, it uh, then it can be incorporated, right? It makes it better. So the pedagogical aspect is very important to use the text, read aloud, perform the text to, to help this reading process. But, uh, and this also brings also the other um, uh, element is how these writers are writing, fighting against the writing system, against the book itself. So Clarice says uh, this Esse livro, this, this is nothing, this thing, like, really, this is nothing. I don't want this, I want to produce music. I want, I, I want different things. So this kind of modernist, also avant-garde, fight against the book as, as an object of oppression because my people cannot read it, but although, and nonetheless, I am a writer. I am passionate with, uh, with writing. So it's this, it's, it's a dilemma that is part of this negotiation. And it's also part of this will to experiment. Yeah, so I think the best fiction in the Brazilian history, one that is very interesting is Paulo Lemis, he's called Catatau, which is already Catatau, the sonoro sound, sound of a word. It's a huge book, but it's also when someone, something breaks, makes a sound, Catatau. And it's, it's we cannot read it, it's impossible, because it's too experimental, right? But he, his character is like Descartes, who had been in Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil, in Pernambuco, when the Dutch were occupying this space in the 17th century. And Descartes were part of the Nassau um, officer when he was young. So Descartes could have been brought to Brazil with Mauricio de Nassau. What would happen with Descartes in the tropics? And then it starts a completely crazy text, mixing different texts and um, poems and things. So, so yeah, I think it's part of this battle. Okay, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, Eva, in your Talk, you, talk, you spoke about call and response, and I'm just wondering um, how that relates to listening in the context. To relate to, to listening? To listening. Yes. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, this is a good question. I think that when call and response might be an answer, it's, it's part of the writing process, right? And, uh, and um, so it kind of... Uh, Increases the reverberational aspect of the text, maybe because it's not monovocal. It's it's already part of a pinch and call and response performance, right? I, I think that this will be my, my answer. 
Thank you for a beautiful talk. Um, I was I'm working on an African on, on an African novel right now. It builds on an indigenous uh, poetic of the land of speaking, where silence is really important and productive because of a particular understanding of embodiment in an environment in a land that's not anthropocentric. The land can speak in ways that can't be contained in language and in the archive. So I'm wondering when you say that, uh, when you talk about conscious listening to silence, yeah. uh, you talked a little bit about the importance of silence in an oral culture and outside cities, and I'm wondering uh, whether you're thinking about forms of embodiment, are you think, or are you maybe tracking an object speaking or land speaking <coughs> or anything like that? Thank you. So, beautiful question. In, in, um, so I thought some of this land speaking appears in the spectrum's um, imaging of uh, listening and hearing. So she said, for example, I want to put my ear in the ground to listen uh, spring comes out from and uh, how the plants are growing and I can listen to that, right? Or the, the animal. Uh, uh, connection that uh, she, she develops in, in images also with this um, uh, listening expanded uh, listening in animals and um, and silence is certainly very this is what really I learned from <coughs> her, her text because it can it can go through uh, the political aspect of silenced communities or communities who are, who are supposed mainly to listen to in terms of even obey and not to speak, because they don't have knowledge. We have the knowledge to teach them, right? Um, there is a very, it's, it's a short passage on Jean-François Lyotard's book, Just, uh, Just Game, Just Game, this is the title. And he describes three modes of listening, Just Game. He said, there is the Moses game, which is this, where, the one who speaks, the one who listens, but he listens as to obey, to obey a law, to obey even something that is not totally comprehensible, understandable, but needs to obey the law. The game of the Western philosophy is not the game of the listener, it's the game of the speaker, because the game of a master and a disciple. The disciple is not the one who listens. It is, it's, it's the one who listens to learn how to become a master. Again, the one who will reproduce the knowledge and create other disciples. But there is a game where the game is the one who speaks, who speaks is, occupies only the position of the listener. And the, which means the authorial aspect is never completed or, or embodied. And, uh, and then he quotes the Kashinawa, which is an um, Amerindian group in the Amazon, where then he describes uh, how the singer, the one who produced the chant, the shamanic chant, is the one who um, does not occupy the authorial position, but only these uh, spirits, invisible spirits, that he, as a shaman, learns how to listen by uh, in his formation, who is doing sleeping time, doing dreaming time. The knowledge comes from dreams, after taking a, a specific um, uh, plant that he inspires, and then this knowledge brings all this sonority of the landscape. And then I really urge you, if you don't uh, know this text, copies the polyglot forest. Is written by Bruce Albert, the Polyglot Forest. It's in English, and I think it's it's on the internet available. And it's all this knowledge from the Yanomami group, where they, because they live in the forest, they don't have big horizons. Everything is related to a listening education that they develop, and they reconnect. Well, when I listen and I hear this kind of animals, or like uh, monkeys in this area, I know that it's the time that the, this kind of fruit is maturing, and then this kind of bird is connected. So it's a whole web of connections, all 
So it's a whole philosophy produced by uh, uh, an apprentice of listening, which you don't have at all. It's, it's amazing. It's very beautiful. And the other book that speaks a lot also about listening in this shamanic practice in the case of Amerindian uh, philosophy thoughts, it's um, the Pico Penawa's book with Bruce Albert, that is The Falling Sky, <coughs> A Queda do Céu, which is the Bianumano, which is, is this shaman um, transmitting to us, non-indigenous people, uh, the knowledge of the forest and the knowledge of shamanism, and also the disasters that we Brazilians are producing in the destruction of the forest. And then, why a mountain there is not only a mountain? What are the spirits that are part? And this not as this transmitted as a very important philosophical knowledge, and not read or transmitted that folklore or oh how interesting are these primitive thing, right? But something that we don't know and they know and that are crucial for respecting this land uh, speaking. Thank you all so much for the wonderful questions.